what, I'll, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to walk through um, four of our case studies that try to illustrate how we approach branding. Um, they're going to be stories for nonprofits and also for profits because I think the same kind of thinking applies to both. Um, and then afterwards, we'll have time to just kind of talk, answer any questions you may have specifically to your needs. Um, so, you know, we call ourselves a, a brand design agency. And often what we end up starting with is corporate identity. And I think a lot of people confuse this idea of like branding is a logo. And for us, branding is not the logo. The logo is one part of the brand, and the brand is a much bigger umbrella. So the corporate identity or the logo is a key part of uh, the process. But it's, you know, uh, one client came to us a few years ago and said, you know, isn't branding where you guys design the logo for us and then we just put it on everything the same way? Um, yeah, I guess you could, you could look at it, that's one way to do branding. But for us, branding is more about the personality, the voice, the messaging, the story. Uh, sometimes we say branding is what people say about your organization when you're not in the room, when you're not there to tell the story of the brand. That's what branding is. It's what people remember about you. But as I mentioned, we do a lot of corporate identity work. Here's some examples of some of the work that we do for corporations. Now, um, as Corey mentioned, we have two offices, Pittsburgh and Honolulu. So between the two offices, we probably work on about 20, 25 brand identities per year per office brand identity system. So that's a lot. Um, sometimes it's starting from scratch. Sometimes it's refining an existing brand that's been around for many, many years. Sometimes it's naming products, services, entire companies from scratch or renaming them. Uh, bless you. So in addition to corporate work, which I'll show you a little bit more later, we do a lot of consumer facing work too, um, restaurant and retail. This is a lot of the fun stuff we get to do. In fact, right now we're working on our 54th restaurant brand. So mm -hmm. we've done a lot of work for beans and burritos and pizza and beer. So mm -hmm. that's a lot of fun. Uh, it doesn't pay a whole lot though. <laughs> Speaking of not getting paid a whole lot, we actually got to start doing work for nonprofit organizations. The earliest years in Pittsburgh when I started the business, in year one, we exclusively went after nonprofit in the arts. Not any kind of nonprofit, we wanted to focus on a niche, specifically because my co founder and I had a very vested interest in doing very visual work that was more artistic and expressive and could be seen at the street level. That's the kind of work we wanted to do. We did both done work with corporate types. Come on in, come on in. No worries, no apologies. I'm trying to keep this casual. Um, so, but we, we treat these nonprofit clients much like we treat our corporate clients. Um, before I started Wall to Wall, I was doing work in-house in the corporations. I was working in small design studios and bigger agencies and so had a range of types of clients and we wanted to apply that kind of thinking to what we felt were the, the clients who probably needed it the most. And back in Pittsburgh in 1992, when we started this, it was the arts and the theater and so forth. So uh, throughout our presentation, I'm kind of asking a couple of questions of you folks too. So here's kind of like the first question some people ask us. How should you budget for the brand? So I'm not going to give you a price, I'm not going to give you a budget range, but I'm just going to kind of have you think about how, how brands get noticed and what they do to get noticed. So this is one way we look at it. It's not the only way people look at it, but for us, to get your brand noticed, you can A, spend a lot of money on media. You, know, you just threw a bunch of money at it, plastered your name everywhere, on radio, on TV, you know, you pound it into the heads of the audiences, they'll remember. That's one thing. Or, if you don't have that, be creative, different, and memorable, right? That's where we try to kind of push our nonprofit clients. 
So you can look at it in a, in a big picture like this, you know, the big budget versus big ideas. You know, if you have a big budget, great. Talk to me right after this week. <laughs> very excited to meet you. If you don't, then we got a, a lot of work ahead of ours. It's like, what is the big idea? And that's the hard part because sometimes our clients are so close to what they do, they think, yeah, you know, shouldn't everyone understand what it is I'm doing? But it's not always the case. Um, here's a little tip about how we price things in kind of a tongue-in-cheek way. If you forget everything else I tell you today, this is the one thing I, you know, think winds up being the most helpful. I mean, how, do wa how does wall-to-wall -wall price ourselves? So here, I've got this official looking <laughs> pricing. <laughs> yeah. You see there's three check boxes here. And there's good, cheap, fast. And our clients get to pick two of these things. Okay, so here's how that works. In case you haven't heard this before, it works for just about any industry. It's worked for us since day one, so I tell all my friends and students and clients. You can say, oh, I want it good and fast. Well, it's not gonna be cheap, sorry. If you want it really good, and you need it really fast, we're gonna charge you a lot of money to do this, okay? And they go, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna game the system. I, I think I figured it out. I want it cheap and fast. Well, yeah, it's not gonna be any good. <laughs> Someone goes, okay, I, I know the answer to this one. It's good and cheap, right? The good part is there, the cheap part is there, that's what we want. And then there's a trade off there, it's not gonna be fast. We'll do it, eventually. We'll get to it, but not on your timetable. We're gonna put that project behind our other paying clients, behind our other clients. So the trade off is, if you have time, yes, you can get it good and cheap. And then we've got the clients who really try to work me and our firm. They say, well, how about this, I want good, cheap and yes. fast, right? And yeah. there, is, there is a way to do this. And we've only done it for a few clients, and not every client has the wherewithal or the stomach to, to give us this. Your creative partner, whether it's us or someone else, if you want good, cheap, and fast, well, they would like something in return. What they don't want is to make this feel like any other job that they're getting paid to do and that the client is dictating what they want. What they want are more creative opportunities. And you, as nonprofits, I'm assuming most of you are with nonprofits, but regardless, you can offer them something they can't get from other people. And if you really need it good, cheap, and fast, one big recommendation I can give you is give your creative partner, your freelancer, your design firm, your ad agency, the thing that they crave most, the reason why they got into this industry, they want to do creative work. And when they compromise on that, they feel like they should get paid for it. But if they're not getting paid for it, and it's a creative outlet, then you're actually giving them something very valuable. So we've actually had clients take us up on this. So I want to take a little side detour about this discussion before I show our first case study. I want to talk to you about this. You know, think back to the old days. Traditional advertising. Traditional advertising's goal was to sell. Sell more products, sell our services, sell. Advertise everything. We're a branding agency and we, we kind of believe in this. Branding's goal is to get you to love the brand. Okay, I'm not gonna sell to you. I want to make you love the brand. Okay, what do I mean by that? Breaking down a little further. Imagine there are two brands. Brand A, brand B. They're very similar. The consumer will choose the one to which they feel an emotional connection. Okay, what do I mean by that? Um, my wife and I have a daughter and three dogs. We have to buy dog food, shampoo, juice boxes, tons of toilet paper, tons of cleaning supplies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we have many choices that we can buy. We can go to Walmart, we can go to Kmart. My wife refuses to go to either. We go to Target, and I've told many clients this story before. She loves Target, and she hates Walmart and Kmart. Okay, those are very two strong words to attach to branding. 
Walmart and Kmart are actually closer to where we live. They offer more products. They're cheaper. Yet, we drive further out of our way to go to Target, spending more money because now both of us love the brand. Now, what we got to do was, instead of, with, with a typical plan, we might show them three, four, five, you know, options. Let them pick, and then we refine, and we narrow, and they pick it apart, and they combine option B and C, and they merge it, and then we come up with something. This particular case, we said, you know what, for this, because we're gonna do this for no money, we want something returned, we're gonna give you one option. Option. <laughs> one <laughs> recommendation. Um, you can check for typos, you can check for accuracy, but we're going to find the brand and we're going to give you our best recommendation and we feel it's going to work and you have to trust us because we do this and it's going to be something different. And they signed off. So, okay, so here's what we recommend. We came up with a visual identity, the logo, the butterfly with the film reels and the wings. And we came up with a name, Silk Screen. Silk related to Asia, screen related to film. There's always room for a tag. So this is not the brand. This is a corporate identity, a name, and a tagline. It's context. And branding, then, is everything else that comes with it. So the brand for us to follow was developing all of the materials, their call for artists, their catalogs, their posters. In fact, in the first year, we silk screened some posters for them. We did all the illustration, we built photography, we handled production. They paid for the hard costs, of course. We were able to sell silk screen posters to help offset some of their costs, but people wanted to keep these things. And we wanted to treat it like a big world class film festival that happened to be in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, targeting a niche market, <laughs> Asian Americans, and people who were interested in that. The challenge for us, and we've helped them in many years since then, was that at the time we're doing the initial creative, we don't even know which films they're going to show. How do you get people to come to a film festival? We're not even telling them which films they're going to see. And in the first year, we kind of talked ourselves into this strategy where this audience in Pittsburgh, any of you ever been to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania? You know it's not like the big hub of Asian culture. Right? <laughs> when I went to college as a freshman, my mom called me from Honolulu. She was like, hey, so what's Chinatown there? I said, mom, I think I am Chinatown. <laughs> <laughs> um, so every year, we have to develop the initial creative concepts without knowing what the films are. But the way we rationalize it is that the target audience in Pittsburgh would not be familiar with these films to begin with. We're introducing them to this director or this filmmaker or this artist. So even if we had a photo of a prominent Chinese film director there, it doesn't matter. So we said, okay, that's not the strategy for this audience. The strategy for this audience is to entice them with something that they think, wow, I, I am curious. That looks interesting. I feel something. I'd like to attend this kind of drive their curiosity further. So everything about the brand since then has been really about that. It's also about the small details too. You know, we feel like tickets are important. Parking passes are important. VIP passes are important. You know, in this eight film pass, they said, oh, we're just gonna produce something ourselves with an eight punch thing. So no, 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 let us do it. So we have these eight hole punches which line up with the film reel wings and the butterfly. You know, little details that might be lost on the client at first, but become memorable for the recipient when they start to see it. In year one, we didn't have a budget for paid media. And this was before social media was as big as it was now. So how do we get the word out? So we learned that they had sponsors, Asian restaurants in Pittsburgh. I said, okay, that's a start. People coming to these Asian restaurants are already interested in Asian food. Maybe they're interested in Asian culture. So we on a super skinny budget, printing stickers at Kinko's. Um, we created these little stickers and I said, think outside the box. And we had the restaurants put them on random boxes, takeouts that you know, every so often, you know, a month before, send them out. No explanation, right? Just no explanation, just think outside the box. Enjoy your meal. 
hopefully, our theory was these people who are already interested in Asian food might see this and go, hey, I wonder what that is. Go to the URL and lead them to this little microsite, this teaser site. There is more to the Asian culture than chopsticks and takeout. Think outside the box. And what it was was a little site that just led them through a series of slides that we wrote and we designed that talked about, hey, you may not realize this, but you're interested in Asian culture. In fact, Asian culture is all around you here in America, and it's all around you here in Pittsburgh. And it's part of your everyday life, but maybe you didn't realize it. And we're going to introduce you to some new facts about Asian culture and arts and history. In fact, you should come to this film festival we're going to be launching. And because you're one of the first to know, and one of the first to notice, we're going to give you discounted tickets if you give us a couple of emails of your friends who might be interested in this too. So we were able to sell out year one virally in advance of any paid media by this technique. And so they grew in year one from a weekend long festivals attracting about 600 or so people to now they're a week long festival in Western Pennsylvania attracting over 5,000 people. And so we've built it up over time, you know, all, all the things you think a brand needs. There's some print, there's some web. Every year, the clients give us a different kind of theme that they're curating. One year might be about music and Asian films. So we come up with a visual theme for that. Several years ago, they said, you know what, we're going to do a festival near Halloween weekend. We're going to make Asian horror films. What should we do? So we came up with this. Silk screen. <laughs> Silk screen. We came up with this tagline, um, which down below says, Scream your head off. And again, we had a very, very limited budget to produce something. So this is a detail from a poster. Here's the tagline down here Scream your head off. Because we didn't have a budget for models, for real models, we photographed our wall to wall studios employees from both Pittsburgh and Honolulu as models for these posters screaming their heads off in a movie theater. That's John, one of our programmers in Pittsburgh. That's Leslie and Celeste from our Honolulu office. That's Ka'a, one of my programmers here in Honolulu. And, you know, we printed these up at Kinko's, tabloid-sized color posters, inexpensively. And we pitched this idea to the client that before we would hang them around town, we would rip all of the posters at the neckline. And they're like, why? We love, we love these posters that came over. They're hilarious, but why do you want to rip them? You know? And the way we felt about this thing was that it was just another layer to this thing that was different. You, know, you see all sorts of great arts posters around town in Pittsburgh, more so here, because there's, much, there's more venues to put posters up in Pennsylvania than here. And all of these posters, generally the same format, 11 by 17 or 8 and a half by 11. They're all up, they all look nice. And they start to feel the same because they're so nice. And we wanted this to feel different because the things that you see every day, you no longer see. Right? The things you see every day, you just no longer see if you are. Like something might look different and you see these in a row and you're like, why is that happening? And then you might go up and take a closer look read a little bit more about it, and hopefully we reward people for reading the fine print, screen your head off, that if they read that and they get the concept, then maybe they're emotionally going to remember it. Because it made them smile, made them laugh. <coughs> Lastly, for this case study, you know, there are clients who ask us, you know, after we do all this, hey, can you, can you do a logo shirt for us? Or a, a logo hat, or a logo coffee? Sure, we can, we can do that kind of thing. They could do that too. We, we kind of cringe when a client just says, we just want a logo shirt, we have to put a logo here and sell them at the festival. Because we think it's an opportunity to reach the audience in a different way, you know? That it doesn't always have to be about the logo. You know, you're just advertising on their behalf. You know, maybe it could be something more that connects with the audience, that makes them feel like, I get you and you get me. So we pitch this idea instead. But the front of the shirt wasn't going to have the logo. It was just going to say, I love subtitles. So you see someone walking around the street with this I love subtitles thing. It might be more interesting to learn that that came from 
an Asian American film festival versus it just being about the festival. That it says something about the person wearing it, too. So that's a case study for Silkstream. Any questions so far before I, I'm just going to keep going? Here's another bit of advice. Your audience isn't asking for the facts. We see a lot of nonprofit websites or brochures that, um, how can I put it this way, bombard you with facts. And they're very important to you. They'll ultimately very, be very important to your audience. But it's not what we feel we should lead with. Because someone will read a fact and someone will, will ask, well, yeah, now what? Or why? Or so what? Or why should I, you know? Tell your story. And I know people have talked about this in the morning pitch, which is great. You know, it's all about not just what, but why, right? Or how. Okay, so here's another case study for a nonprofit called the Hawaii Primary Care Association. I don't know if you're familiar with them or not, but before they came to us, I was not familiar with them at all. And when they came to us, this is what they look like, and their story, in a nutshell, is that um, they are an umbrella organization that helps community health centers across Hawaii get funded, get awareness, and these community health centers are are often located in very rural areas in underserved communities that may not have easy access to a hospital or a facility or a clinic. So many community members rely on going to a place like this. And the Hawaii Primary Care Association helps to advocate on their behalf, helps to get them the proper funding and visibility that those individual community health centers are struggling to do. And they'd also like to try to somehow unite them under this umbrella of the community health center so people understand what is a community health center. People think, oh, that's just where like the homeless people go or the drug addicts go. No, no, it's, this is where the community actually goes. And oftentimes, people who are uninsured, this is their only means to get any kind of health care as a community health center. So regardless of their ability to pay, that's why community health centers become so important. But, however, the message became lost amongst the facts that were bombarded on the homepage of the website and the secondary page. So what we try to do when we do our brand audit is try to kind of step away from the facts a little bit and we just talk to our clients about, like, why are you doing this? Why should I care? And in the course of our discussion with them, there'll be certain themes that bubble up. And we pay attention to these themes more so than the facts. We're not ignoring the facts, but we're, we're trying to come up with, you know, what is it that might make people care about what they do? And then how are we, as the creative branding folks, going to then translate that somehow visually or through creative messaging? What are the central themes that we want? And so we talked about theme first before we do a lot more with the client. And once the clients agree with us, Yes, these are central themes. Then we start into our branding process. I'm going to kind of accelerate this a little bit, and I'll show you the three brand pitches we gave to the client. In the old days, we would just show like, okay, step one is we're going to do a logo, pick a logo, like it. Step two, apply to some business cards, like that. Step three, do a brochure. Step four, here's what your website might look like. Step five, do this. And we found that early on, we were losing people in step one. Just how do I pick a logo? <clears throat> and sometimes the logo was given so much emphasis that people struggled to say, oh my god, I can't choose between A, B, and C. How do I make this decision? So over the years, we've evolved our process where in the course of presenting a brand, we present a more fleshed out, integrated brand up front. It's a lot more effort and investment of time on our part. But in the end, the client can see that the brand is not the logo. The brand is everything put together. So we show them, in this particular case, three possible features of your brand. Imagine your brand in the future, it could look like this. So we have them also set up as three themes, and we pair them with three logos. So the first concept we 
came up with was this theme of care for all. It became kind of one of the guiding principles in the design. So we start to show them, here's what we mean by that. For example, you could add this little brochure. We believe healthcare is a right, not a privilege. Care for all, meaning we're not going to turn anyone away, right? Here's how some art direction could look. Here's how it could look on the inside. You know, as you can see, there's some greeting in there. We're not getting into the details. We're getting to a feel. I'm trying to get them to understand that a campaign could look like this. At my community health center, they not only treated my diabetes, but taught my whole family how to improve our diet, start exercising, and adjust to this big life change. I'm not the only one who's healthier now, thanks to my CHC support. And this isn't just for us. They do it for everyone. So we started to write and imagine these stories and say, maybe there are people like that that you described to us that we could then turn into actual stories. We thought about these inspirational posters we could put in all the community health centers. Community health centers, CHCs, make sure those who can't afford health care don't go unnoticed. HPCA, care for all. Community health centers won't turn anyone away. Here's another one. Can you distinguish between the, ins the insured from the uninsured? Neither can we. More than 100,000 people in Hawaii don't have health insurance. At community health centers, we provide top shelf care to all, whether you have insurance or not. So we got at the most meaningful messages that we heard as outsiders and tried to envision those as the leading messages as opposed to the facts. These were more emotional messages in our opinion. So this is what brand concept A kind of felt like. So it's about a feel. Here's another one, which we called more than health care. Something we learned, you know, and tried to put all together, community health centers are more than health care. It's the insured, the insured plus uninsured. It's trust and experience. It's holistic in technology. It's A plus B. We had this idea for a logo that kind of looked like a medical cross, that also looked like a plus symbol. And maybe we thought that that plus symbol could be a part of what the brand was about, more than you think. Our experts know more than 17 different languages because we're treating multicultural audience here. CHCs do more than just provide high quality integrated primary care to patients, both insured and uninsured. They also provide cultural healing expertise, transportation services, translation, and more. Patient-centered healthcare as it should. CHCs and you. So a sample of what a brochure could look like. We wanted to dispel the myth that it was just clinics for the homeless, drug addicts, etc., but also much more than that. That they had equipment just like real hospitals mm -hmm. and staff with technicians who are just as good as you find at the big hospitals. And that there were two sides to the story each time. So this was a storyboard for a potential public service announcement. And this is how campaign B looks. So this is what we would show a client in the first round of creative presentation. We go through a very high definition, quote unquote, mock-up face. Mm -hmm. It's a contradiction. But to us, this looks like a sketch. And to some clients, they can just start to see, like, oh, I see what you're talking about. So they see it in high def, but it's really still a sketch. And then the last campaign we call Feel Good, which is that after coming to a community health center, you should feel something. You should feel welcome because it's in your community. You should feel confident because we've got the equipment and the staff and the know-how just like a real hospital, but mostly you should feel good. Feel proud. Community health centers depend on dedicated staff who care about the communities they serve. The YNI Community Health Center provides jobs for more than 500 employees and essential care for thousands more. HPCA, feel good. Feel healthy. We had inspirational posters designed to be put into the various locations and to inspire them all to feel good. Right? So this is a sense of like what the art direction was like, the style, the language. Prevention is the best cure. 
checking in with your community health center doctor before you get sick can help you feeling strong and healthy for years to come. Feel good. And then we had a pitch for a public service announcement, a TV spot. So we would show storyboards tied to this with a script or voiceover and the tagline, we feel good when you feel good. So our recommendation was actually this campaign, which they also agreed. So they said, yes, we love this feel good idea. However, we kind of like the logo that you presented in campaign A. Could we kind of mix that one into this one? And in this case, sure, yeah, we felt like we could do it. And this is what we had pitched initially. <coughs> This idea that their old logo was a was a tea leaf plant and a tea plant and tea leaf, and we came up with this idea based on this Hawaiian proverb that a tea leaf can be used to form a cup and <coughs> fold it into itself to gather water as a symbol for preserving life and health. And they loved the idea that it was still a tea leaf, but that it was now tied to something more directly related to how they feel about their organization, nurturing providing care. So we went through a refinement stage. So these are more technical things that we have to do. We'll refine the logo, make everyone happy with it, and eventually come to one that everyone loves, and then start to provide the brand standards, show people how you can use it. Worst case scenario, one color, and then beyond that, and then start applying it to the brand. We go through you know, all the things that you've probably gone through before. Hey, we need a business card, we need letterhead, we need stationery, we need these forms, we need this, that, and the other thing. And this is the launch of the new website. So image. Content on the website becomes very important to us too. All through this process, we're thinking about how do we get away from that barrage of facts that they used to have. And the way we feel about content is kind of the inverse how many of our clients feel about content. A lot of our clients like to front load the home page with tons of content, and then as they filter down, it gets even more and more dense. <laughs> we like to kind of go at it kind of like this, where the amount of like text content up front is a little lighter, so it's skimmable. People can, at a glance, understand what it is that you do and all the ways you do it. And when someone is digging deeper for content within your site, they're actually looking for more information, so we give them more information. They're looking further, we're going to give them more content more dense facts and so forth. So we don't want to turn anyone away at the, at the home page level where they're like, oh my god, this is too busy, too much text. You know, we've all seen sites like that. We also launched the Feel Good campaign with its own microsite and its own campaign internally to their staff, their volunteers, their doctors. We wanted them to know about the campaign before the public did. We wanted them to buy into it and understand it so that when people came in and mentioned it, talked about it, they were well aware of what this was before the general public. And we think that that's an important step with many organizations is that make sure your folks know about it before the public knows about it. Sometimes it doesn't happen that way. So there's print collateral that went along with it, some signage. And then um, later on, we also helped them with uh, some of the presentation materials. The, the advocates go around town, they talk to people about this, and they found that the, the big hurdle was also just understanding what is a community health center. So one of the things that we produced for them was an uh, informational piece. Um, I'll play a little clip of it. It's an animated video that talks about what is a community health center. In Hawaii, are building the future of healthcare. First, community health centers are nonprofits. So, unlike other providers, community health centers aren't focused on treating as many sick people as they can just to make money. Instead, community health centers work with each patient to get well, be well, and live well. Unlike most private physicians, health centers provide care for all patients. So whether you get your health insurance through your employer, or through a government program like Medicare or Medicaid, or even if you have no insurance at all, you'll still be cared for at a community health center. So it was the idea of being able to kind of go through the facts in a more meaningful, engaging, and hopefully emotional way too. Um, we've, we've helped this organization with some spin-off projects too. They created a documentary film called Ola, Health is Everything. And they tell the stories 
of the local community and the community health centers and how this idea of healthcare can be uh, accentuated and how lifestyle can change when you think about health before you think about healthcare. So it was an interesting aspect of the project we didn't foresee, which was getting involved with documenting these stories and helping to produce a film. And then uh, here's the public service announcement, which ran on TV and also is shown in, during movies at the trailers. From providing essential care to communities in need, to treating the whole person all in one place, Community health centers are doing what's right for Hawaii. We feel good when you feel good. So that's a case study for healthcare nonprofit. Okay, here's another case study, and I, I tried to kind of couch these things with some themes and some tips, so there's some sort of takeaway for all of you. Um, and this one, I'm just going to call it sometimes if it ain't broke, you can still fix it. In other words, think bigger. So what do I mean by that? So this is a for-profit client, retail client. Uh, a couple years ago, we were approached by uh, Josh Feldman, who owns this company called Tory Richard. You may be familiar with them. Um, he said, hey, I'd, I'd love for Wall to Wall to take a stab at our brand. And you know, my opinion was that I thought the brand wasn't broke. So I said, why, why do you want us to help you? you know, I'm, I'm a fan of your products. Uh, I've been into your stores. I've shopped there. Um, seems like you guys have a good thing going. And he said, well, we've been doing everything in-house for many, many years. And we feel like over the past several years, we've kind of plateaued the brand at a certain stage. And we're not quite sure how to get to the next level or even what that next level is. So we proposed as the first step that we would do the brand audit, which was we would come in as outsiders, peek under the hood, and they were going to pay us to critique them and tell them the good news and the bad news all together. And then they could decide what to do with that. They could hire us or someone else to take some recommendations or take it in-house and run it. Okay. So we asked them to send us everything uh, that they could about the brand so we could start to kind of learn more. Um, one of the things that w they sent us was a, was a bag of a bunch of tags and things. And even something small at this detail level for us is important. And you can see, or as we saw, which was obvious to us, was that there was a huge variety of things they were doing visually with the brand, some of which they were using some old logos from the earliest days in 1956, beyond some things that they've done in the 80s and 90s. They tried their hand at a, at a mark. They tried some illustration. I don't know what this caveman is doing in here. <laughs> they have a separate line, 56, which is their modern line, but named after the origins in 1956. So there's a lot of things going on there. Um, there's also, you know, very interesting enough, there's a women's collection. And one of the things Josh told us is that they've been struggling with how to push the women's line. And ironically, they start off as a company that focuses on women. But they've become known over the years as like the men's aloha show. And uh, Josh, the owner, kind of cringes at the idea like, no, we're not an aloha shirt company anymore. We're, we're more than just about Hawaii. And there's a kitschiness associated with aloha shirt. So we, we talk about resort wear instead. So we said, okay. And they sent us their catalogs. They're what they call their lookbooks. These are the things that get sent to the retail buyers and say, hey, here's what's coming up next season. You should order these things. And, you know, they spent some money on photography. And they want us to critique these, which we did. We, of course, visited their retail locations at the time. So this is a shot of their Ala Moana store, their original Ala Moana store, if you have been in there. And one of the things Josh told us there, again, the women's line doesn't sell really well in the store. It feels like a men's store. We don't attract as many women in here. I like the store personally, and Josh says, oh, I love the store too, but it was designed by four guys who wanted kind of this men's clubby feel and it worked at the time, but now as we're trying to rethink our brand, maybe we should rethink this. So they were in talks with 
an interior design company called Philpotts and Associates to help them with that. They wanted us to kind of brainstorm with them on some things, which we did. Right, so I'll, I'll fast forward to like some of the things we presented in the brand audit, the brand critique. So we kind of looked at elements of the brand. For example, one big element, visual element, photography. This is their current photography at the time. You know, the current images are beautiful, but tend to be more literal. So we, we learned that they were shooting photography for two purposes, for their catalog and their advertising, and a need to serve two purposes at the time because they're trying to save money. But for us, a lot of the images were very kind of, you know, stand forward, don't wrinkle the shirt, make sure all the buttons are in focus. Yeah. Don't show it like this, because people want to see the front, so people tend to stand like this with their front <laughs> face and face. Yeah. And then we asked them about, during our brand audit, you know, which brands do you admire? Which brands do you wish you could be like someday? You know, what are the aspirational brands? And he named all the big fashion brands you could probably name yourselves that are on the national and international scale. And so we looked at their photography. And what's the difference between their photography and our photography? You know, it's like, for Tory Richard, because they were trying to kill two birds with one stone, photography is very literal. This to us was more emotional photography. I, I don't even see what this guy is. It's because and the light bulb moment for Josh came up when we said, right now you're a clothing company, but really what you aspire to be is a lifestyle brand. It's not that I want to buy that shirt. It's I want to live that lifestyle. There's a difference. Eventually they'll buy the shirt because they believe you've found the way to get that lifestyle. That's a big leap for, for a retailer to make. It's like, really? I can't show my shirt? Okay. Can't show my shirt? Or, <laughs> really? Can I show some of the shirt? <laughs> yeah, you can show some of the shirt. We're not saying don't show any clothing, but we're saying here's an extreme case where it's not always going to be in focus, it's not always going to be front facing, you're not going to see everything, but you're going to get a feel. And that feel goes a long way to getting someone to believe that they should buy. Because it's, it's a combination of these things. Here we critique their copy, their, or we call it the voice, the copywriting, the text, right? So this is the before. And this would be like the most elaborate text that they would have on any given piece. We struggled to find it, like on their home page. You may not read this, but it says Marrakesh Tile, which is this pattern. Marrakesh Tile coming soon. Right? And then you have this. And this would be like on direct mail and their e blasts. It says, Curry Richard, Men's Holiday 2012 Resort 2013 Collection, New Arrivals. The facts. So we looked at the aspirational brands and we looked at what do they do with copy and voice? And how do they do it? And we found that there are lots of ways that other brands do this very well. Copyright. Personality, theme. J. Crew has this thing, Jack knows best. For style advice, tips, and questions, you don't want to ask your friends. He's your style wingman. Have something to ask Jack? Send your questions to jack at jcrew.com. Um, other ways that people are doing little things to shift away from the obvious things. Instead of like a button on a website that says, Buy now, you might say, shop this low. Tiny little thing, you know. The social media links. Events, fan photos, exclusive features, and non-stop happiness. Go. You know, it's the little things that might make someone start to feel something about what your brand stands for. And then you kind of put all of that stuff together. You know, Kate Spade does this very, very well. Kate Spade, you whether you're familiar with her or not, she's kind of embodied the entire brand. There's kind of a sense of a style, a personality, a quirkiness. Sometimes it's about selling, but oftentimes it's, it's not. It's about a feel. Brands are like people. Sometimes they're funny, sometimes they're serious, sometimes they're selling, and sometimes they're not selling. You don't want to be the brand that is always selling. Because then you are that guy at the cocktail party 
that's always trying to sell you something. Nobody wants to talk to that guy <laughs> at the cocktail party. So I kind of couched it like this. Know what makes your audience tick. And then push their buttons. So know what gets your ex audience excited and then excite them. Know what makes them laugh and then make them laugh. Know what makes them cry and then make them cry. You know, know what makes them tick and then uh, tick, tick them. <laughs> tick them. Push your buttons. So, this case study is um, for the very, you know, I mentioned earlier we were working on our 54th restaurant brand, but this is the very first one we did. So in 1993, these two young entrepreneurs who were in their 20s at the time, they came to us. We were in our 20s, my co-founder and I. We were in our second year of business. They were in year zero. And they'd heard of us from some of the arts work that we had done. And there were these two guys who grew up in Pittsburgh, but went off to college. One guy went off. East Coast, one guy went to the West Coast, and then they moved back to Pittsburgh. And they realized, man, the Pittsburgh dining scene is lame. It's terrible. It's very traditional. It's meat and potatoes. And they missed a lot of the cool vibe that they saw in the East Coast, catering to the young 20 centers. Hip little bars and out of the way neighborhoods that had funky loud music late into the night that served really good food, had awesome things to drink at reasonable prices had some funky vibe about it that they couldn't quite pin down. Said, so let's do that here. So they had this idea. They came to us. They said, hey, we've got this location picked out. It's in between Carnegie Mellon University, University of Pittsburgh, McCain University, and Chatham Homes. Lots of young people. In this out of the way, hole in the wall area from a failed restaurant, so the rent is really cheap. We've got this architect friend of ours, she's in her 20s, and she's got this idea of using cheap, reclaimed materials everywhere, like rustic look, hardware, industrial meets rustic. We've got this young chef, he's 23, he has this idea, nothing frozen, nothing canned, everything fresh. Can you guys do a logo for us? I'm going to call it Mad Men. He said, hey, this sounds awesome, but we want to do your whole brand. And then, of course, they said, well, isn't branding when you give us a logo and you put it on every name? They said, yes, that's one way to do it, but we think you have an opportunity to create this brand personality. I'll tell you what, we'll do your logo for your low budget if you give us first right of refusal on doing everything else for your brand from now on. Meaning, you want first stab at it, no matter how small you think the project is, ask us first, and let's build this brand for you on a shoestring budget. So they said, okay. So we started with a logo. This is what we came up with stylized cactus that symbolized Mad Max. The place wasn't really going to be authentic Mexican. In fact, the two owners, one guy's Jewish and the other guy's Korean, <laughs> had a wicked sense of humor. So we said, hey, here's your brand. It's going to be not real Mexican. And we're going to use air quotes because we're kind of tongue in cheek about this. These guys had a wicked sense of humor, these two guys. The chef, again, so it's going to feel fresh, like the chef's food. It's going to feel kind of reclaimed and industrial, like the architecture. And it's going to be kind of funny, like you two guys. And it's not really Mexican. So here are the menus that we developed for the first launch in 93. No one was doing anything like this back then in Pittsburgh, for sure. But we hand-built 70 menus out of the same types of wood finishes they were using in the interior and hardware like they had exposed on, on their doors and so forth. And um, we sanded them by hand and varnished them and we drilled them and screwed them in and stamped them. And we're never going to do that again for anyone else. <laughs> uh, seemed like a good idea at the time when we were in our 20s. We also rewrote all of the menu copy that the chef provided. Because to us, it was very much about the facts. Here are the ingredients in this fish pot. You know? And instead, we said, we're going to rewrite every line item to make the owners laugh. Because if the owners got it and they laugh, then we felt that the audience would laugh along with us and that we're all in the joke. So we took inspiration from the menu and we got rid of things that people wouldn't care about. And then we just kind of made up crazy semi-Mexican facts to pepper this thing in. And somehow it worked. They said yes. And so we rewrote everything. And every four months, we rewrote the menu again because the chef came up with new items. So we'd spent three days just like... Mexican puns, puns about cheese, and how many different ways can we say tortilla? Um, but we had a lot of fun with it. 
And the goal was like, if all of us were having fun, we were our own target audience. We were in our early 20s, and we wanted to build the place that we wanted to go to. So we did. It instantly became very popular, and we started kind of fleshing out the brand. So we had this first writer refusal clause with them. So every little thing they did, hey, we need napkins. Do you guys want to design napkins, or should we just go to napkin guy? No, no, we want to design napkins. Hey, we need um, aprons. Yeah, yeah, we want to design the aprons. Like, really? Uh, we need, you know, everything. We just said, let us do it. Hey, uh, the chef needs a microwavable box with some way to denote that like the veggie burrito isn't the chicken burrito because they look the same from the outside. We don't give the veggie guy the chicken. So I said, all right, we'll, we'll design a series of wraps that go around these microwavable things. Everything going out the door will be branded. So, you know, we create wraps and stickers. The sticker said, I heart, and the kitchen staff could fill in the chicken burritos or, you know, pork nachos or whatever. So, um, eventually they got figured there. They were approached later that year by the supplier who supplied them with their tortilla chips in-house. And they said, hey, you guys now, within the span of a year, are our biggest customer. Could we license the Mad Max logo and sell your chips in grocery stores? Because we do that for other restaurants. You know, we do Chi Chi's brand, et cetera, et cetera. So the owner said, well, we're okay with it if our agency wall to wall is okay with it. Go talk to those guys. So they came to us and they gave us this pitch and said, hey, we're gonna take your logo. We came up with this mock-up for this bag. As you can see, you know, the, the best bags have a window on it so you can see the chip. Bright colors everywhere, a lot of Mexican motif. And so we went back to the clients and said, we think selling chips is a good idea. We think the bag package that came up was horrible and it doesn't look like your brand. So can we redesign the bag? I said, yeah, chip sure, redesign. So we negotiated with this guy. So we, we don't want a window. We don't want bright, bright colors. We only want minimal amount of colors. We don't want the shiny plastic bags. Give us the slightly more expensive matte finish bags. And so we did something that just didn't look like any of the other chips at the grocery store. Like going to the grocery store chip aisles, like going to the cereal aisles. Like who can scream the loudest? We said, we're, we're gonna take a slightly different approach. And a year after that, the chip guy came back to the owner and says, now Mad Max is their biggest selling chip line out of all the chips that they sell. We started doing their advertising. Um, one of the things we advertised was the fact that they don't have a drive through because they're in this urban area. So we came up with this dial and dash Mad Pack thing where you could call ahead, we repurposed six pack carriers, redesign them, so they, they're known for these really big burritos. So you can get six big burritos and six microbrewed beers to go. We call that the Mad Pack. Special price for that, you can choose, order in advance, and then call us, you can pay for it in advance and call up, and then when you're nearby, we're gonna just run it out curbside, there you go, and then you're know, off to your party. So that's the way we kind of came out around with the constraint. <laughs> Free gas with every fill up. We're not afraid to make fun of ourselves as a brand. We would rather make fun of ourselves before someone else makes fun of us. So why don't we write our own jokes about ourselves before anyone else can make fun of us? Right? Control that crazy thing. This is now, by the way, their most popular t shirt still to this day free gas with every fill up. Mad Max. Um, in year one, later in that year, we, we also did. What they thought they would never do because they didn't think they could afford it was their first TV commercial. My co-founder, James, always wanted to be an actor. He's kind of a ham. So he dressed up as a Mexican game show host. I always wanted to direct, so I hired a camera crew and I got to play director. We had a $5,000 budget to shoot this TV spot. We ran around town interviewing people, dubbed the whole thing in really <laughs> bad Spanish, and it ended with this Mad Max logo. And it was kind of curious, but then it won the client and us are our first Addy or like Kelly Award. Uh, I think just because it was so weird and unusual, but it made <laughs> people laugh. Um, and then just like Tori Richard and just like HPCA and many of our clients, as this brand grew, we had to develop like brand guidelines, for, you know, corporate guidelines. Sorry, what's the Mad Max corporate standard? So for Mad Max, because we're so different, the, the brand standard toolkit looks like this. It's not like our corporate, corporate, corporate standard. So we, we talked about it because the influence was like street art, Mexican street art, and kind of being more urban, 
influenced by Hispanic culture, textures, but with a humor that we're not really, really Mexican. So when we launched in 1993, they won all of the best of polls in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh Magazine, best restaurant of the year. There were soon lines around this little tiny place. It was like a thousand square foot restaurant. And they needed to grow, and they have grown. In the second year, they said, hey, we're going to open another restaurant. We said, oh, another Mad Max. And said, no, we're going to go from seven bucks a plate to about 10 bucks a plate. Uh, we're going to use the same chef. He's come up with this other idea. We're going to do a Caribbean theme. We're going to have uh, more cocktails. Um, same architect's going to be involved, but we've got a bigger space now and more prominent area in Pittsburgh. We're going to call it Kaya. Can you guys do that whole branding thing again? We said, sure. So we did the whole thing all over again. Started the brand up from the ground up. And in 1994, that one best new restaurant in Pittsburgh. Uh, still very popular today. Funky, same vibe. So we did everything from logo to matchbooks to menus to advertising to newsletters, gift cards, you name it. We said, everything, give us first right of refusal, and they respected that. The next year they said, hey, we're going to go from 10 bucks a plate to now 13 bucks a plate. And we're going to introduce like funky pan Asian cuisine to Pittsburgh. Can you guys do that whole branding thing again? So we launched Soba in Shadyside, a very kind of upscale neighborhood. Same architect was involved, she got a bigger budget, we were involved, we got a bigger budget, the chef was involved, he got a bigger budget. What was happening was these two co-founders were getting tired of eating burritos all the time. <laughs> <laughs> they just wanted, they wanted to up their palate a little bit, so they said, hey, we should open up. Yeah. That one best new restaurant when I launched. Following year, they said, hey, we're gonna introduce Mediterranean cuisine, and we wanna build the most extensive wine list in Pittsburgh. And I want you to do the whole branding thing, we're gonna call it Casbah. So we launched Casbah. And that one best new restaurant in 1997. The next year they said, we're gonna introduce upscale comfort food. We're gonna go to like 17 bucks. We're gonna take over this old retro diner. We're gonna modernize it. Same architect involved, same executive chef, and us. So we launched Mr. Jones. That one best new restaurant. Fast forward to the 11th year in business. They opened their 11th theme, each one more upscale than the last, just kept climbing, on 11th Avenue in Pittsburgh, and it's called 11th. And it's now their signature restaurant. It's their first American bistro. It's got a bakery built in, awesome architecture. You know, Mad Mix number one was launched for $90,000. 11 was launched for $1.5 million. So they've grown but still kind of kept it relatively lean. But this is a client that has understood what this idea of the brand experience. You can have a great burrito and beer, which other people can also then copy. But if you have a brand personality that's not quite easily definable, that's harder to copy. And I might want to go to this place because they've got burritos for seven bucks, but it's in this, you know, like, ugly, fluorescently lit, super bright kind of strip mall versus this funky place which is like got character and texture and humor and vibe for the same price, which would you choose? So emotional branding, in our opinion, will win if all things are equal. So that's a case study for our first restaurant client that we still work with today. If you ever go to Pittsburgh, I subscribe to Pittsburgh Magazine still to this day to keep up, but if you ever go to Pittsburgh and someone says, hey, I want to take you to this funky bar, this right, so is a good chance it's part of the Big Burrito Restaurant Group. Um, I just got recently Pittsburgh Magazine's Best of Restaurant Issue, and there's still three of their restaurants on the list. Not all 11 themes have survived the economy. These are the surviving restaurants. So, fun story. Lastly, I'm just going to show you a little bit more about what we do. We've showed you some print, we've showed you some web, some online. Um, we also do a lot of work in broadcast and motion graphics, animation, and sometimes this is a way to tell the story, kind of like I showed you with the HPCA case study. We started doing this kind of thing early on um, because we were animating using um, Macromedia Director, if anyone's old enough to remember that, multimedia authoring tools, you can create CD-ROMs, then we were doing some things for 
the local PBS station, WQED in Pittsburgh, hired us to animate a logo for a CD-ROM software title. And then they said, hey, we, we like that thing that you did for us. Can you give us that because we want to put it in the tail end of the show? We're like, well, we'd have to use a different software. I mean, yeah, technically we can do it. So, so good. So then we immediately went out and bought After Effects. We had to quickly learn how to do it. We said yes before we really knew what we were doing. And then we animated this thing for them. They use it for broadcast purpose. And then we start thinking, hey, what if we did that for our other clients who don't think they can afford to be on broadcast, like our nonprofits? So let me show you one of these case studies um, for a nonprofit. They want to do a public service announcement for drug and alcohol addiction. And they had this opportunity from the TV station who was willing to do it for free. We were doing their print and online branding, but this station said, oh, we'll, we'll produce it for free. And they did, and a client hated it. said, it doesn't look anything like what you guys are doing. Even though we showed them all the stuff you guys are doing, it doesn't look anything like it. So we asked if we could take a stab at it. And they gave us a very modest budget to do it. We said we can't really do it for free, but let's see what we can do. And they gave us a lot of facts and figures from this PowerPoint thing. And they said, can you turn this into public service? And we said, no, we have too many facts here. But the thing that we got from all of these facts and figures, the takeaway we had was that drug and alcohol addiction, it's not that homeless guy in the street. It's not the crazy loud guy at the end of the bar who's there all the time. It could be someone we know. And sometimes just lurking below the surface of what seems to be normal life is a fact that you should all be aware of. So we said, here's the kernel of the idea that we want to build on. And so this is what we do. So from a budget standpoint, for a nonprofit, you know, there's no camera work, no actors, no voiceover, stock music, it's stock still photography, which we kind of brought to life in this, not 2D, it's not 3D, we call it 2.5D. Um, we did this 1999, it was our first digital broadcast spot, so it's 15 years old now, but this technique is still being used now. And the idea is that you can still tell the story without spending a ton of money if you can kind of understand what what is the story telling, and is there an emotional connection to the story that we can tell? Um, I'm just going to show you uh, a few other things. So, in addition to to doing that, now we also work not only with animation but with videography. Of course, sometimes we shoot it, sometimes a client shoots it, sometimes we hire a DP and a production company to do it, depending on the budget. We work with an organization called Blue Planet Foundation for a few years, and in a similar fashion, they came to us with a PowerPoint with lots of facts about renewable, clean, sustainable energy right here in Hawaii. And they said, can you turn this into a 30 second spot? And of course they said, no, but we can do something else that drives people to your site, that talks more about it. Again, keep it simple and get people to be curious about it.
lastly, I'll just show you um, our broadcast reel. Um, this shows a little bit of the kind of digital effects we do, digital storytelling, some editing. We even do some animation for larger ad agencies who might not do that in-house, so there's some work for other people behind the scenes. So to just kind of sum things up in a recap, if that's possible, a couple of things that I talked about today. To get your brand noticed, you can either spend a lot of money or be creative and different. So it's the big budget versus big ideas scenario. Remember this equation, how should you budget for the brand effort? Good, cheap, and fast, pick two. Traditional advertising goal is to sell more products. But we, we believe that branding's goal is to get you to love the brand. So don't always be selling or asking or begging. Your audience isn't asking for the facts. Be careful about how many facts you throw at them. Tell your story. Sometimes if it ain't broke, you can still fix it. In other words, it might be good, but maybe it could be better. Think bigger. And then know what makes your audience tick them off. <laughs> Push their buttons. So lastly, you know, it's, it's all about, in our opinion, emotional branding. You know, they'll laugh, they'll cry, and maybe they'll remember. So this last commercial on this show is actually a commercial we did for Wall to Wall. We, we sponsor a show called Mad Men on AMC, and in exchange they allow us to run a TV spot uh, for over 13 episodes. When we first started doing this, we asked the dumb question. We said, hey, instead of running one spot, could we run like 13 different spots every, you know? And we said, sure, if you want to do that. So we made it really difficult for ourselves. So every week, we had to produce a commercial for ourselves. We, we did 10 of them. We didn't quite do 13. And they're mostly experiments because we don't really advertise for our services on TV. So it was a way for us to do something that we want to do for other clients without having to sell anything. More kind of crazy, inspirational, random bits. So here's one of my favorites that we did, and I'll leave you with this. So.
I have a question for you. First of all, I'll happily volunteer to let you have I've been to lots of fundraising seminars and uh, various informational settings, and they all say, put your donate button on every page of your website. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? I think from a technical standpoint, it makes sense to make it accessible, make it easy to find, make it available. Um, I don't think it should be the biggest button on every page. I think there also should be a page dedicated for that, like when someone hits donate now and leads them to a place where they're about to give, you, know, you kind of do your last pitch on why you should give, so maybe you might give you more. Um, so I'd agree with like, from a pure user interface standpoint, don't make someone hunt for that because it's very important for nonprofit to, like, to receive the donations. But it's how it's done too. Um, you want to keep the rest of the site engaging, not too cluttered, and as long as that doesn't become like the biggest part of your website, I think it makes a lot of sense to make sure it's available on your page. Just like the, you know, about might be or the who we are might be. I think that kind of thing is A lot of your work seems to have an air of mystery. It's, it's uh, uh, and I like that, but I don't always have faith in the audience to, to get that. So I, I just wonder. What, that's a really good question. So some of our work has an air of mystery. And will the audience get it? Um, I will say that you know, perhaps what I've shown today, uh, I've kind of cherry picked some of the, the more kind of um, fully realized brand visions for the client. There are times when some of our work is a little less mysterious than what I may have shown here. The nonprofit was right. Rare. And I'll also say that you know there are times when we, we get a feel that a client wants us to dumb down the message a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. So, which is kind of related to what you're saying, but maybe in a slightly different way. And we're always afraid of that. You know, the way we feel about that is if you dumb down your brand, you're going to get dumber. Um, Smart up your brand, you're going to attract smarter people. Make a brand funnier, you'll get funnier audience. Make the brand more inquisitive, and you'll get more quiz of audience. So, the worst thing you could do, in my opinion, is to kind of dumb it down, or water it down, or to blank it down, because then you're going to attract that audience. We give the audiences as much credit as possible. We want them to be smart. We want them to think like us. And we think there are people out there that think like us and think like the clients that believe in that. So we ask them to make a leap and say, let's smarten up the message. Let's be a little bit more clever. Because the people who get that, those are the people you want. Some people, it might, might be lost on them. And there will be, will be some attrition to your target audience. You can't attract everyone. So who do we want to attract? Who's in the sweet spot? Let's go after them. What are they like? How smart are they? What kind of humor do they have? Is it appropriate? What are the emotional buttons we can push? And then let's go and push those buttons. So we, we aim straight for that thing. We say we want to aim really high. So that's, that's a hope sometimes it doesn't happen, but that's the Yeah, half it. Yeah. <laughs> That's a really good question. When we work with a nonprofit client, how do we determine who their audience is? We sometimes don't know right off the bat. Sometimes it's not obvious. Sometimes we have to invest in research, focus groups, surveys. And there are many ways that you can do that, right? You can hire or we can hire a research company. That's probably at the at one end of the spectrum of cost. The other spectrum is like serving the people that you know as an organization and maybe even the people we know. So it's kind of anecdotal through like a friendly list, people you already have on the list. Ask them about things. And ask them who they know that might be interested in those same kind of things. So it's through some Q&A that we do with clients. Sometimes they can tell us, yes, we're after people or this, this, and this. We try to find out like what they have in common. Instead of saying, hey, we want 
CEOs of organizations. That's a very specific thing. Like, well, what else do you mean? Well, they have the means to donate. Okay, so there's a financial component. Or they're interested in causes like this. Okay, so it's a cultural component. And, you know, some mundane things like they live in this state, or they live on this island, or they live in urban areas, whatever you're looking for. It's a process. There's no easy way to do it other than to ask ourselves these questions and then do a little bit of research to make sure that we're right. And sometimes in the end, it will be a pretty good guess. But it's not always going to be perfect, and it's something you've got to keep adjusting. It's a moving target. Uh, Oh, well, I have a lot of questions. Uh -oh. Thank you for your presentation. Sure, go It's on. awesome to see that you're still having fun and producing such quality work. It's Thank really you. inspiring. Thanks. Um, I have so many questions. First question is, do you actually go over the cheap, fast, and good rule in your presentations to potential clients? Uh, not, not all of them. <laughs> okay. Because, I mean, that's it comes, like, it comes, comes up sometimes. You know, we, we all discuss them among ourselves, but I'm actually, like, intrigued to see in your presentations, okay. it's, what it, it's exciting to see because I think there's probably not enough education mm -hmm. with clients about how much things cost and right. how much work it is to do the actual do. So, yeah. Um, yeah, people think that because we have oh, computers really? yeah. now, oh, you know, just kind of like, you should do that. <laughs> right. Much like in the same way, many organizations will do this in house because they have to. They don't. They can't afford to use outside help, and that's fine too. Um, and then you know, kind of looking at that in a different way, some people think like, oh, you know, I I bought Adobe Creative Suite for my person in house, so therefore they should be able to design because they've got the design software. But that's like saying like, I could buy a typewriter and suddenly I'm an author. You know, it, it's a tool, and there are people who are better at using those tools than others, and there's a sliding scale of what you should be able to afford to do. Not everyone can afford to do this, um, and we can't afford to do it for free for everyone, too. So there's somewhere in the middle where it makes sense financially. That's always a hard part, right? I guess, and the other two things I would just say is that um, you don't actually address it directly in your presentation, but I think that relationship that you have with the client mm -hmm. matters. I mean, to me, that's what I see in the way that you excel in the Mad Max restaurant yep. line, but you have this relationship right. um, that allowed you to say that first, what did you say first, last, and I don't know, mm -hmm. first right of refusal. Yep. And I was really intrigued with that too, because mm -hmm. I've never um, I've never presented that as an option to a client, but I'd be very interested in pursuing right. that idea. So talk to you, talk to you more about that. Yep. Um, I just I can talk a little bit about just that one point. The reason why we brought up this idea of the first right of refusal on the because they were ready to just pay us to do a vote. Mm -hmm. They're ready to say, all we have is $600 <laughs> for a logo, and we can't afford anything, so if you just give us that, we're going to plaster it on it. Yeah. I mean, I know a lot of us are coming out from office here, yeah. but it's really like a balance between, and a lot of your work is just really cool. Yeah. Yeah. But um, is there a balance between like looking too cool and like looking too yeah. good? <laughs> and actually like a non-profit because I mean like for instance with the foundation that's really great but initially I thought oh they must have a lot of money to be able to do this stuff. Um, I don't know if I can just speak Yeah, we, we have lots of clients who tell us during our kickoff meeting we ask these kinds of questions like what do you want your brand to look and feel and sound like and one of the things that does come up and it's a very real concern and a real constraint that we have to work on is like <laughs> and, and we try to be respectful of that. And there, there are lots of things that we do that are purposefully designed with production technique, either the use uh, or restraint in the use of imagery, or uh, expensive versus inexpensive materials that we purposely say, okay. And produces one color for you. It's going to have black and white photography. It's still got to be colorful and emotional, but it can't be glitzy and slick. So, got, you know, so that's a constraint. The more constraints that we have on the assignment, then the more focused that end result will be, and the closer we'll get there in round one with the client. So it's it's helpful to know that. And some clients 
come to us with one, you know, interesting concerns. Hey, we want to look much bigger than that. We're only a three-person company, but we want to look, you know. And then we have the opposite. Hey, we're a giant corporation, but we want to look like a small thing. <laughs> so it, it's lots of different ways to kind of shape that perception. But that, that's a really good question. Yes, we, we all have to do that. Yeah. I'm just curious about soil literacy organizations and also you know, young children and advocacy for early childhood. It's kind of like, I feel like our personality is just like we help. Mm -hmm. And we don't get to be like edgy or interesting or too quirky. Mm -hmm. But this is obviously much more attention getting. Can you give some example or suggestion on how a nonprofit was sort of a very non controversial message and we don't want to be too controversial? How do we be more edgy and get people's attention and feel relevant without like looking like we're going into advertising as opposed to our core mission? I think that. How um, do we get a personality? I guess that's what I'm asking. I think a lot of nonprofits have this fear that their audience thinks they're going to spend too much time and attention on advertising. Kind of related to what you're saying, too. I think you have to give the audience a little bit more credit than that, that they see like it's, it's a part of what has to happen. That, oh, they're, you can advertise your advertising sake and do something that doesn't move the needle, doesn't make any sense, and then, then that, that's a waste. But there's got to be a, a brand strategy up front that you go through. The first thing we show clients is not the fun, sexy stuff, right? The first presentation we give the clients is a very, very dry document that we walk with. It's the brand audit. So you've gone through these exercises, I'm sure, which is a SWOT analysis, right? We talk about your strengths, your weaknesses, the option. Then you talk about the position, you talk about the audience, and you kind of get at what the message is and what the strategy is before you can even think about what's the application, like advertising. Do we do a TV spot? Do we, can we be edgy? And there are times when we tell the client, you cannot be edgy, you cannot be funny. It doesn't make sense. And there are times when just doing an ad that just gets the awareness out may or may not be the right thing to do. Right? So it's, there's no easy answer to say, like, how, how would we approach this and live with our song and helping people with that? Um, I think it was State Farm who said this interesting ad campaign. I'm, I'm going to paraphrase because I don't remember all the details, saw it, but it stars a basketball player who is known for assists. Right? He's, he's, that's his statistic. And I think it was State Farm. Their spin on this was like, Oh, there are these two twin brothers who are separated from uh, But they're really good at assisting. One guy was on the court, but the other guy's always helping kids out in school and helping things out, and he became a state farmer. So there's a way to personify the brand attributes through something kind of funny and quirky about being great at assists. 